Hello, everyone, and welcome to Middle Fantasy, the show where I talk about science fiction and fantasy. I am your host, Zach, and I have a very special episode for you all today. Today, I'm going to be getting into Uncharted Waters as we talk all about Fire and Blood by George R.R. R. Martin. Now, when it comes to George R.R. R. Martin and A Song of Ice and Fire, for me, it's an interesting topic because it's really one of the cornerstone series for me that really got me into fantasy. Yes, I had read Lord of the Rings. I actually read the Night Angel trilogy before reading A Song of Ice and Fire because growing up, being a teenager, you couldn't escape A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones because when I was a sophomore or a junior, the show had just completely blown up. And if you were like, it's almost like FOMO, like Fear of Missing Out, where I had to like really watch it. And being able to watch and then read the books and kind of fall in love with Fantasy, again, really discovering books like the King Killer Chronicles, the Gentleman Bastards, the Dresden Files, and really like discovering a whole new world has been amazing. Now, when it comes to supplemental material books for A Song of Ice and Fire, I haven't really read them. I haven't read The World of Ice and Fire or The Maps of Ice and Fire. I've read a Duncan Egg short story, but I haven't really delved into them because when it comes to this, it's just something that I'm not necessarily into. I mean, Getting into A Song of Ice and Fire is tricky enough, but getting into this history book as we're going to get into is actually very, very fun. So why don't we just get into the review? Now, when it comes to this book, first thing I'm going to have to say about Fire and Blood is that it is a history book and not necessarily a fiction book, meaning that the tropes and things you're expecting from like a George R. R. Martin book are necessarily going to be there. They're going to be like little footnotes. They're not really going to be expanded upon. You're not going to have a character that's going to be like, what's this? Well, let me tell you this. And then you have to reread the book a couple of times. Like, oh, this is what makes perfect sense because if you read the entire books and then go back and then really be into the world, that happens here because it's a history book. It's a little different. It's almost like you have to like really delve into the story and really understand the history a little bit prior to actually reading this. Though with that being said, I like history books. And for this, this is actually a really fun history book because what George R. R. Martin does here within this book is he doesn't make history boring. He actually makes it fun, though I was kind of a little wary the first time I was like picking this up. I actually got this as a birthday present uh, this year and I was like reading it and I'm like, am I really want to get into like a fake history book? I mean, I had read like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter or like World War Z or like these fake like history books. What if some we have a twist with the history of this character, but make it like a straight history book? Whereas when it comes to Fire and Blood, George R. R. Martin really plays up the history aspect of it and doesn't make it like tongue in cheek. He takes it very, very seriously, which I think is really funny to me, and it totally works. Now, for people that don't know what this book's about, it's about the conquest of the Targaryens for the first 300 years. It goes from pretty much Aegon's conquest all the way up to Aegon III, and then there's going to be a second volume that goes pretty much up until Daenerys, which kicks off like a Song of Ice and Fire. Though, when it comes to this book, you're really just getting footnotes of everybody. From what I've heard, like he actually kind of like imported a bunch of the material from the World of Ice and Fire into this book. And I haven't read that, so I don't necessarily know. But for me, I found this to be so enthralling, especially when it comes to the history aspect of it. Now, when it comes to like the story, what are the characters? Well, you follow all the different Targaryens up for the first 150 years or whatever it needs to be. And you kind of discover like, oh, who is reigning this time? Who is trying to assassinate this person? And for the most part, that's what's really exciting about it. Because it's a history book, you don't have to necessarily be in one viewpoint character. Almost like even in the book, uh, it's actually not written technically by George R. R. Martin. It's actually written by a maester. So it's like a book within the world. So when you're reading it, it's almost like you're just seeing events. Though it's actually kind of fun to actually kind of read the book and then kind of speculate. Oh, well, did this actually happen or because we're looking through this through the lens of history, things necessarily didn't happen in this way. This is just like, you know, history is written by the victors and the losers are just, you know, broken down into pretty much dust. And what I love about this book is it's very black and white when it comes to a bunch of the stuff and a bunch of the history because you're getting it from really just a neutral perspective of, well, here's Aegon's conquest. Here's the reign of Jaehaerys. Here's the dance of the dragons. You're hitting all these huge events that they've talked about in the books and now that you can go back and actually read the you know the whole history of it you're like okay this makes more sense so when you go and read a song of ice and fire and you're talking about like you know jaharis or they're talking about a different king or there's like a character in who informed the gold cloaks like you're understanding like the history of everything coming up to king's landing 
and it really adds to the character of King's Landing as well as the Targaryens. I literally did not give two craps about the Targaryens. I mean, yes, Daenerys was cool. Hey, does anybody want coffee? Sorry, I just had flashbacks about the last season of Game of Thrones. Sorry about that. But, you know, you, you have these things where I necessarily didn't care about the Targaryens. For me, I've always been House Stark or House Greyjoy. And I found them to be so much more interesting. Though, when it comes to, like, reading about the Targaryens, there's, like, this humanity that's put into them. You understand, okay, this is why they reign for so long. And they had all this infighting and all these horrible things to happen to them. And that's kind of exhilarating, especially when you're reading this book. Because when you're reading this book, it's very, like, neutral, especially what makes a good history book, because this isn't necessarily a good fiction book, is that what makes this a good history book is that it isn't dull. It's having the event that's actually laying out a bunch of things, though it's almost like weaving in a way where, like, you actually start to care for these people. It's, it's funny because, like, when I play, like, an Assassin's Creed game, and, like, I'm so sad this person died, and the person's like, how dare you ruin or spoil that someone dies in the game, and I'm like looking at, like, Ezio, someone that lived during the Renaissance, and I'm like, well, I hope he's dead by now, because he'd be 400 years old, and he'd just be a walking spooky skeleton. And you kind of feel for that, like, there's a lot of these kings, that, like, you read about them, like, you follow like, the whole life of, like, a bunch of these people, you kind of get a little sad when some of them pass away, because some of them pass away through old age, some of them through assassinations, through some of them through just nefarious things, and some of them just by their own doing. And that's something like when it comes to Fire and Blood, the pros for this are actually kind of fun because what I mean by that is they're fun because it's from a historical standpoint, like everything's black and white. There isn't really much description other than like so-and-so from this year to this year. And they have like little side tangents compared to like reading just a regular narrative book where like you might be following like one Targaryen, but it's like little did you know back on the ranch, if you go uh, down here, there's one other Targaryen or like a cousin of someone was doing this whole thing that's like, wait a second, rewind that. I actually kind of want to know more about that person because they're sailing around the world. I'd love to hear that story. Well, we're back to Jaehaerys. We're back to like the Dance of the Dragons. And like, oh, okay, uh, that's that's fine. We can we can move on here. And there's like those moments that are like very gripping. Though the one problem with this book is it is long. Holy God, is this book long. It's over 600 pages and it feels its length. Like... There are some parts where when I was reading this book, I did have to take breaks, maybe a couple days, to get through whole sections because it is long and boring because there are parts in this where it's like, okay, I want to get to the fun stuff, but while you're reading it, there's like these little tangents, much like a history book. Not all history is exciting. So you're just like sitting there and waiting and waiting for cool stuff to happen. Sometimes cool stuff does happen. And you're like, oh, that's rad. But then there's times about like, they're going to talk about taxation. They're going to talk about mercantile politics and i'm just like okay this is a history book so i guess that's fine but when you're like 25 pages into that whole discussion about certain things you're just like Ugh. so if you don't like tangents like that this might not be the best book for you now the one thing that i absolutely adore about this book is how george R. R. martin really incorporated the magic system within this book even though it's a history book he still has that magic system now when it comes to westeros and song of ice and fire uh, this magic system is both low and high fantasy, like, fluctuates the more that you read. And that's a, that's a discussion for another video. But what I love about this is because the Targaryens have dragons, we have, have like, a different perspective. Like, magic technically exists in the world, but the dragons, I think, almost, like, they're just creatures that just shoot fire. But because of that, they have, like, this military superiority, which is, like, the equivalent of, like, Hey, what if, like, these medieval people had, like, an air force after, like, abandoning, like, a doomed civilization? And they really show that, and I think what George R. R. Martin excels at with this book is he really shows how powerful, like, no wonder the Targaryens were able to conquer Westeros very easily when they had these gigantic hulking flying flamethrowers. It's almost like those warthogs that have, like, a gun just built around the plane. It's the equivalent of, like, that. But that's, like, the cool thing about this book is, like, it shows the magical stuff, but it isn't goofy, like, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, where it's, like, tongue-in-cheek. It's more, like, in the terms of, like, this is actually scary, and this is how, if this were to happen, how things would happen within the conquest. And I found that to be so much fun, because it didn't hinder the book, more as, like, enhance it. Because we learn more about the dragons, we more, we learn more about, like, the bonding, and I found that to be so exhilarating. 
Now, when it comes to this book, who would you give this book to? That's kind of a hard question because if you're a fan of Song of Ice and Fire, you're really going to get a lot out of this book. If this is the first book you pick up, I don't know why you would pick this book up, but you, I mean, you can, but you're going to be totally lost. You need to actually kind of read a Game of Thrones a little bit, or at least have like an understanding of the world a little bit, because they don't have like a definition of everything, like, and nothing's going to be, you're not going to be babied in this book. You need to kind of understand certain aspects of the book to really understand it. They're not going to explain like the Night's Watch. They're not going to explain the conflicts between House Stark or like the Baratheons and all this stuff. You actually have to really experience the world and then really delve into this book. You're going to get a lot out if you've re really read these books. If you've never read it, you're going to be totally lost. Like I actually kind of had to look up a guide a little bit on certain things because I kept forgetting certain things about some of the houses and like where things were. And this book doesn't hold your hand in that way. And if you want to read this for the first time, you can. I mean, if you can't get past that this is almost like a fake history book, you're not going to have much enjoyment out of this. I like history books and this was a really fun history book. Yes, it drags, but most history books or good biographies do drag. Now, who would I give this book to? Again, you can give this as a gift or someone that really likes Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire or really likes the Targaryens, like they're rocking like their Targaryen shirt or something. You can do that. And I just recommend like when you're giving it to someone, you got to actually kind of know the person a little bit because this book's kind of really expensive. I mean, I think one part of it has to do with the illustrations, which are gorgeous in this book, like by Doug Wheatley. Like everything about this book, it reminds me a lot of like the 10th anniversary of The Name of the Wind. This is a book that's really expensive and that it feels expensive. And that's the great thing about it. It has some amazing artwork, some pieces I would love to hang up on my walls. Though, if you're going to give this to someone, chances are if they don't like that type of stuff, they're not going to enjoy this book. Would I recommend this book? Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend this book to a certain amount of people. People that are very into Game of Thrones, who are really into like fantasy or who are really into like fake history or like history books where they can talk about you know fictitious historical events they'll really really enjoy this book because that's what the target audience is for i mean will i read the second part of fire and blood you know what i probably will will i get it on launch that's something to decide later on i mean there's some other books that george r, r. martin has to kind of write first we're not gonna talk about that but i'm interested to see when that second part drops and just see like really getting into like pretty much tiptoeing up into the first book and like really understanding the stakes and what's happening, especially like the more the stuff that we know about the first series with uh, Game of Thrones, you like really getting into it and seeing like the historical aspect of it versus the reality. And that's Fire and Blood. Thank you all so much for watching this amazing video. If you liked it, maybe subscribe down below. If you really enjoyed it, maybe give me a thumbs up. That would help a lot. What is your guys' favorite reign of the Targaryens? For me, it was Jaehaerys. I thought that was so much fun. The Dance of Dragons was really cool, but I kind of had like an emotional response when it came to Jaehaerys and kind of got sad when he you know, passed away. I'm not going to say how he did, but uh, you know, 300 years, you tend to die and stuff like that happens. Thank you all so much. Now, I really appreciate you all really watching these videos. The comments, the responses have been just so amazing, and I just want to thank every single one of you. Now... As always, may your food and drink ever be tasteful, and may your books be ever filled with fantasy and adventure. See ya guys! Bye!